Good evening, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. So New Year is coming up. Lots of people want to think about, uh, you know, the past year and the future and things like that. So I thought it'd be really interesting to uh, to reach out to uh, to someone I know. Uh, Dimple Mukherjee uh, is uh, someone who I think is very inspirational, has written some uh, incredibly interesting writings about uh, about knowing yourself and, and what's important in life. She's an occupational therapist, a word coach, and the author of her latest release called Word of the Year, True Stories About Intentional Living Using the Power of a Single Word, which is now available uh, on Amazon globally and Barnes and Nobles. Uh, her Dimple's life philosophy is rooted in and centered around good health and wellness. Dimple has dedicated the past few years to learning and understanding how profoundly words can shape our lives and improve our mental health. You can reach uh, Dimple and get uh, her workshops, programs, and coaching at www.dimplemukherjee.com, which is D-I-M-P-L-E-M-U-K-H-E-R-J-E-E.com. Dimple, how are you? Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm doing well, Brian, and thanks for having me here today. So how can a single word help you? What is the power of a single word? So there's so many ways, and I often think about all the synchronicities that happen when you call in a word, but really, if you want to look at the science behind having a word of the year, our brains really like primers, and by primers, I mean things that prime us into action. And the shorter that primer is, or the more visual, or or the more sort of like succinct it is, the more power it is, powerful it is. So a word, instead of setting a New Year's resolution, if you call in a word of the year where a lot of people have been really adapting this practice, and there's a movement that's happening where people are are foregoing setting New Year's resolutions and embracing the word of the year because it's um, a powerful tool for us to apply to all aspects of our life. So it's not just one specific goal, but it encompasses all aspects of your life. And it's just like a fun and a light way to really live your life one word at a time. What do you mean by intentional living? So by intentional living, I mean, you know, um, you put some thought um, and dedicate space and time to really understanding your purpose and your values. I think those are really key and really important in terms of gaining clarity to how it is that you want to live your life going forward and for to for for creating forward movement that is aligned with your values and your purpose but a lot of us may know our values a lot of us may know our purpose we think we do but it really requires a deeper dive and spending some time with yourself i'm a big advocate of stillness like creating stillness and space in order to do that what do you mean the deeper dive So that, okay, I do, there's many ways to do that. Some people do that through meditation. Some people do that through journaling. My favorite way is through journaling, but really creating space. And for someone who's not used to even having stillness or are constantly on the go is really just about putting in 10 minutes in your schedule and just either meditating, which to be honest, meditation is not my biggest um, tool in my toolkit. Journaling is. So really creating that space just to be on your own in, in, in solace, by yourself, in stillness, and really understanding what it is that you want from your life um, and what your values are and what is it that you want to dedicate time to. Give us an example of some appropriate words of the year that people might yeah. consider. Yeah, so there's so many, um, but some common ones are transform. Um, Mine is awe, like as you can see back there for 2022, there is nourish, there's nurture, there is devotion, there's delight, there's magic, there's um, tend, there's love, love, joy. Like those are really, really common ones. And this year, I'm actually exploring into the territory of having a word of the year in a different language. I actually haven't called in a word of year in a different language. So that's something new for me that I'm starting to like look into with people that are engaging in this practice and uh, seeing where that takes us. What do you mean by awe? So awe came to me and there's a little backstory. So I've been calling in a word of the year for about seven years. And over the years, what I've noticed that words will do once you start engaging in this practice is they have a um, sequence. So my my word for 2020 was command. 
And my intention for command was to really claim my self-worth and really not minimize sort of the things that I offer to people. So that was my goal for 2020. But as you know, 2020 had something different in store for us. So what command became, command became more about really um, allowing myself not to be shifted by the external circumstances and really returning to my internal locus of control when the world around us was falling apart, so to speak. And then what happened in that year was I realized what things and people and experiences were really important to me. So the things that I thought were important to me were not really important to me. Um, I think a lot of people had that sort of aha moment in 2020. And then in 2021, I called in the word tend, which is my word for this year. And it was really about tending to the tend, T-E-N-D. Tend. Yeah. So it was really about tending to the things that I now know actually matter and growing them. And I called in awe because now that I've done tend, I wanna I wanna step into 2022 with awe and create awe worthy experiences for myself and for my loved ones and for and to service my community as well with awe worthy experiences and service. We're chatting tonight with Dimple Mukherjee. She is a uh, occupational therapist, a coach, uh, a word coach, and she's written a book. We're going to take a break and come back more with Dimple in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Second Night 60. We're chatting tonight with Dimple Mukherjee. Uh, She is an occupational therapist, a word coach, and the author of her latest release called Word of the Year, True Stories About Intentional Living Using the Power of a Single Word. It's available on Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, etc., um, Dimple, so 2020 was command, 2021 was tend, and 2022 is ah. And you write down these words and put them on the wall behind you and read it every yeah. day? Yeah, that's the first thing I do when I call in a word. So usually that's towards the end of the year or the beginning, and I leave it up there. And it sort of just simmers in my body. And a good litmus test for people when I'm teaching them or facilitating a workshop around calling in a word is to allow that word to penetrate your body, really sit with it, sleep on it, see how it sits in your body. Your body is a great way to test if that word lights you up. What you want are words that light you up, that really um, evoke a sense of motivation, I think is key when you're trying to create the life that you love and allow it to inform you. And I'm someone who believes in synchronicity. So if you do nothing else, like I do also teach about living your word, but if you do nothing else, but just call in a word, you'll see a lot of synchronicities start to occur in your life. You'll see your word everywhere. It's, it's again, it's that neuroscience piece. I like to believe it's a little bit of magic. And um, when you see your word, it primes your brain and it reminds you why you actually called in that word. Called in that word. What do you mean yeah. called in that word? It, it so I, you? He, huh? it just comes to you. You call it in somehow. So everyone has a different process. For me, this year all came to me. It didn't, I didn't have to intentionally call it. So when I do my workshops, when I teach people and go through the process of calling in a word, we do a reflection. So we look back at the year that was, we then do a visualization about creating our best life. And then we do journaling on what kind of life it is that we desire for the year ahead. And from there, we call in a word um, by sort of like listing all the words that we've seen in our journaling prompts that are calling to us and clarifying what our values, what our purpose, what it is that we desire, what does it mean to live our best life? Um, And then we distill it and you come to a word. And it's amazing because I've led you know, typically I lead two hour workshops, but I've led one hour workshops for Amazon, um, for auto trader and for law firms, for corporations. And it's amazing to see that everybody walks away with the word of the year by the end of the workshop. And that may not end up being their word maybe two days later, but it definitely brings them closer. But most of the participants walk away with the word of the year and it's really exciting. Really? And, and, and this is interesting. So it's a whole process that you go through. Let's walk through this process again. So yeah. the first thing you do is you 
you go through the year that was mm -hmm. and understand what worked for you and what didn't work for you. Right. Correct. And, and what do you do? You write it down? You journal about yeah, it? What? Yeah. So I usually have a workbook that goes with along with the workshop that I've created. And the first half of the workbook is dedicated to series of prompts. And what we do and why I love this process is I do it in group formats and having the energy and harnessing the energy of the community or the people that you're gathering with is really important to um, reflect or mirror back to you what it is that you shared and what's lighting you up and what isn't. So that reflection and the give and take in a community like that where the space is held so sacredly and there's room for vulnerability. I think that's really important. With what do you mean room for vulnerability? So for allowing people to feel safe, to really share rich, authentic parts of themselves when sometimes they may not do that in like a work setting or, you know, even with my friends, there are things that I may not share because my friends have known me since I was 12. So coming together with people that are all attracted to this practice is bringing the like minded people together and feeling safe and creating that space and allowing people to be able to share deeper. It really helps to bring out what it is that you want for your life ahead. Okay, so the first thing is understand uh, the past year and what mm -hmm. worked for you and what didn't work for you. Then the second thing you said was that you want to figure out I, how you're going to live your best life or something. So what I do after they've done the reflection prompts for the year that was and what they're taking forward into the year ahead, we do a visualization. So I do a visualization for about 10 minutes where I'm leading through and through a guided visualization about creating the best life. It's similar to the future self. There's also a lot of research behind um, visualization and really dreaming up what it is that you want your future self to be like. Um, so I use those tools to help people sink into that state of what it is that they want. So it's guided. So I talk through it for the entire 10 minutes while the participants are, you know, have closed their eyes and are relaxing. And the minute they get out of this guided visualization, they go right into a, um, a journaling prompt about all the things that they've seen, heard, tasted, felt, like basically using all your senses and writing out what it is that you saw. And then follow, and then thereafter, what they have are a few more journaling prompts about what do you see yourself doing in the year ahead in December? If you were sitting in a cafe and you were with a friend, what would it be that you'd be sharing? So the future self is a really key part of this process um, and really dreaming up how you see yourself and how you want to see yourself and helping you call in your word. Cool. So you, yeah. you, you, number one, close your eyes and you visualize the better you, the future yeah. self. Yeah. And then once that's done and you do that for 10 or 15 minutes, once that's done, you write down all the things that you felt, saw, smelt, tasted, et cetera, when you were that better self, where you yeah. were in that future yeah. kind of situation. Yeah. Fascinating. Right. Yeah. And then from that, and then, from the, and then from that, there's a few more journaling prompts about future. So like future, future, how do you see yourself in, in your relationship? How do you see yourself at work? How do you see yourself as, um, you know, giving back to community, like service and purpose, meaning and things that you do. And then they distill down. So you go back to all your journaling prompts and you circle all the words that stand out to you, like that are powerful. And then from that, they start distilling it down. And then we do partner work. We do small group work. We do all kinds of that work to help each other figure out or at least narrow down what are their choices. And then we do an active listening and sharing piece in, in partnership, which is really powerful. And then we come back to the big group work and everybody has a word. It's, it's I've, I don't think I've done a workshop where somebody Maybe one person or, you know, over the years or two people have been struggling. So as a group, we help them in terms of, okay, what does this word feel like in your body? So it's that piece, the group piece that is just as important as the facilitation piece that I do. Why is the group, see, gr the group piece so important? Because that's the, the piece where um, you're mirroring back to each other. You're reflecting what it is that you saw and what it is that you're seeing that the person's not seeing in themselves. And I think this that's is, really powerful. This is fascinating. How'd you get into this temple? Yeah, you know, um, so as an OT, so I work um, within a very allopathic medical model as an OT, and I learned um, in school, we um, learn a lot about science, but also social sciences. And I love the people piece. I really loved 
um, really tapping into my clients sort of um, inner 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 purpose or their, their heart centered desires. I find that very fascinating. I love groups because I love how the group um, really comes alive when they're together versus when they're individual individually working with me. I've seen the power of groups and I got into the word coaching when I did it myself. 10 years ago by myself, I did it on my own and I started practicing it. And then three years went by and I thought, why not? You know, we were having a girls night in with my girlfriends and I said, why not make it intentional? Like we always just get together and there's no real structure or purpose, which is great too. But I was like, you know, we haven't seen each other all year. Why not get together and let's do this. I, there was a little workbook that a blogger had um, shared. So we downloaded a workbook, we did it together. A two hour night ended up being an eight hour night. <laughs> And it was just incredible the things that we shared with each other. And even though we've known each other for like almost all our lives, having that structure, having those intentional prompts, having that peace was so key for us to tap into our inner desires that we've never probably expressed to each other because we haven't had permission. And that's the same, like initially I was doing this practice with women but I started working with organizations and corporations and it's, it's, such, it's such a beautiful practice for anyone to adapt and, and embrace. Um, and it's been working like wonders for people. You've always been, you know, I think I met you about a decade ago or so. You've always been a very spiritual person, I yeah. think. Yeah, I am. Where did that come from? Actually, interestingly enough, that did not come from my family. So even though my background is East Indian, um, I was raised very religious and I don't consider religious um, practices to equate to spirituality. I actually stepped into spirituality when I um, got married. I got married and I started to get to know my in-laws at, at a very young age. I was 18 and they're very spiritual humans and they're and very like um special to me even though i'm not with my husband anymore they're still very special um, people to me and they taught me a lot about spirituality and i think also you know going to india really um being being raised in that culture there is religion but there's also a lot of spirituality in that space and just painful moments in life i think pain is a great teacher so I've gone through some great pain. Team. Yes, I've gone through some transitions in my life, which were very painful. And I think that they taught me how to um, really connect with spirituality for, for comfort, for nourishment, because those are the healthy ways for me to work through pain or work through grief. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had my share of numbing my pain, running away from my pain, avoiding my pain. But I really think that if you sit with your pain, it's it's one of the biggest teachers you can have in your life. Sit with your pain mm -hmm. instead of trying to numb it. Running rather than running away from it or numbing it. Uh, what yeah. do you mean by that? Like just not dwelling on it? Is that what? You no, mean? not dwelling. No, some people will um, drink to numb their pain, right? Like you drink, uh, have a drink because you don't want to or, or avoid it through work. A lot of um, people will take on extra work because they don't want to deal with some of the realities in their life. It's too painful, right? So let's focus our attention on work or on our kids. So the attention gets taken away from you and you rely on external either substances or alcohol or people or your work to really avoid the pain and dealing with the pain. So I learned the hard way. Actually, there was a very, um, uh, enlightening conversation I had with somebody a couple years ago who um, was explaining to me how she sat in her grief and it was very painful but it helped her get through that pain and get to the other side and never have to look at that pain again so I think there's a saying in therapy and it's, it's something like the only way through uh, the only way out of it is through it I think that's the saying and I've learned to not numb my pain and instead sit in it, process it, allow it to take over, do its thing and come out of it stronger. Hmm. That's, That's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have a common friend that, uh, that seems to not have gone through that. Mm -hmm. What's the... What's the secret to, to doing it? Come to the realization you've got to be able to do that or? Yeah, you have to have awareness. 
There has to be a desire, there has to be a willingness, but I think the step one is awareness. There has to be an awareness that this is what is helpful. This is what is going to be helpful, trusting the process, right? Um, that, that's the first step. And I think it's hard for a lot of people to do that. So many people have uh, numbed their pain in the last year with alcohol or drugs, yeah. things like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, what would you say to those people? Well, we are living in very unusual circumstances. And I'm gonna, um, the one thing that I've recognized or realized, observed rather, um, during the course of the pandemic is that it, it's, it's unprecedented circumstances, but I think the people who are faring better are people who already had a self-care practice in place prior. So the people that already had a strong, for me, that's my morning rituals. I'm someone who, it's a non-negotiable for me. I get up at usually 5.30. I dedicate a very, not everybody can do this. I, I totally appreciate that, but I get up at 5.30 and up, up until about 8 a.m. That's my time to read, to meditate, to journal, to listen to podcasts, like anything that will elevate my frequency and my energy for the day and get the day started, which also means I go to bed early, but it's a non-negotiable for me. And I think that really helped me get through the pandemic. Now, having said that, these are unusual circumstances and we all cope with um, stress differently. So I think it basically comes down to what were your coping mechanisms prior to the pandemic? What do you mean elevate your frequency? Oh, yeah. So without getting into the jargon of law of attraction and you know all of the quantum physics, but I do believe that if you're resonating at a higher frequency, which basically means that um, you are someone who is thriving and you will attract more of the good stuff into your life. So trying to keep yourself at um, a frequency where you're functioning and finding joy in your life every single, almost every day is important. And to find out what make, helps you do that, I think is important. So I also think that when we do the word of the year, those are some of the things we explore and we look at what is it that actually brings you joy, not just happiness, because I think happiness is fleeting, but really exploring that. What's the difference between happiness that you think is fleeting and joy? I think happiness is circumstantial. I think it's, um, you know, um, something happens in your life and you're happy, whereas joy, I, I think it's more of a deeper emotion. So it's more of a state versus a feeling, I think. Um, the other- Joy know, state, not a feeling. I think so. Um, now people can maybe argue that maybe it's an emotion, but it is more substantial, I feel, than happiness is. Um, the other experience, and I don't want to call it an emotion because it could be an experience, is fulfillment, feeling fulfilled. And feeling fulfilled doesn't mean you're happy all the time or joyful all the time, but it means that there's purpose and meaning in your life. Yeah, well, that's the Viktor Frankl in search of meaning. Yeah, yeah, know, that's you've right. You've got to have uh, some meaning in life. You have to have your why. You have like to you have, have your... your why. You have to know what your why is, because if you know what your why is, you can overcome any obstacle. That's sort of the, the book. That's what Viktor Frankl um, talks about in his book. It's an excellent book. Excellent Simple. book. What's your why? Oh, I just posted something on Instagram. So my why are my kids, obviously. Um, but outside of my children, my why is service to the community. I think um, I've been told in many interviews by whether that's, you know, um, on podcast or through psychic readings or you, you name it like the whole gamut that um, I'm a healer and I and, and I do believe that I'm in the profession of occupational therapy and coach because I value health like good health is one of my top priorities or and top values in my life. Um, it's up there with connection and it's up there with experiences and travel. Um, so for me, I think my why is really dedicating my life to helping people realize that good health is, is something that is achievable and in their power. Like I just want to empower them to believe in their health and that they have control of it. Lots of good words, empower, yeah. connections, yeah. good health. Yeah, good health is big, big for me. So I'm very um, passionate about that. 
if people want to follow you or access you from a coaching standpoint, how do they do that? They can just go on my website. It's probably the easiest place, dimplemukherjee.com. So D-I-M-P-L-E-M-U-K-H-E-R-J-E-E.com. I have to make that easier. And there are um, different ways to follow me. You can follow me on Instagram. I'm probably the most active on Instagram now. And, or you can sign up for my newsletter. That's probably the best way. Sign oh, I got to sign up for your newsletter. Yeah. And, uh, and remind us uh, the title of the book. Yeah, I have it here. You want to see it? Please. It's called The Word of the Year, True Stories About Intentional Living Using the Power of a Single Word. Beautiful. And I think this is perfect uh, for this time of year as people are thinking about New Year's resolutions uh, uh, or the word of the year. Um, and I think that your comment about you know thinking through the past year is very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, and I interviewed uh, someone a year ago uh, who talked about a process they um, go through, which is sort of like your living up to your grief or however you described mm. it. Um, but it was that they thought through all the bad things that they wanted to get rid of and not take into the new year and wrote it down and burnt it. And yeah. the, the physical act of writing down the bad thing they didn't want to bring into the next year and burning it was a way of trying to ensure that they didn't bring, bring that uh, negative, uh, negative emotion or negative experience or negative person or negative, whatever it was into the, into the next year. Yeah. That's a very powerful ritual. And I'm a big, like, I love rituals. That's why I do my morning ritual, but that's the act of doing something is, is very powerful. Dimple Mercury. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing with us the idea of uh, a word of the year so that you can more intentionally live your life to its fullest. And I love the, the best you or future self uh, attitude that you've got as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Brian. We're going to take a break and come back uh, with more in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody.